have been a staunch hater of steroid users my whole life. The Olympics was like my dream. That was all I, I trained for, thought about, ate, slept, and drank like all through until I was a senior in high school. You can not really understand sprinting, the mechanics of it, the technicality of how to start on a block, but you can watch two people race and you understand that one person is going faster than the other. You can have no understanding of jiu-jitsu and watch a jiu-jitsu match and you know nothing about what's going on. It makes no <laughs> sense, right? When Lance Armstrong tested positive, it like ruined my, my world because I looked up to him so much as this athlete that was breaking the mold on what was possible. The most valuable lesson I ever got since starting jujitsu, I was really like bummed out one day because I was just injured and like, and he goes, hey man, rest is a discipline. And I was like, damn. You, you like anticipate the conversation a little bit. So it's, I don't know, it's not nerves like you're about to compete in something or like going to a job interview, but there's you just, you want to deliver a quality episode to the listeners. So that there's that little bit of like uh, purpose to what you're about to go do. And so I definitely feel something just before you get the conversation going and then it go, that all goes away. Yeah. The, the, the worst part for me is, is the, the awkward countdown because most people just like <laughs> sit there and stare at their camera. And I'm like, I'm like, we can continue to talk. Yeah. It's okay. Like, so, but yeah, no, it's definitely when the first time I got interviewed by someone, uh, I was like so nervous, especially because I kind of like looked up to them. They had a bigger platform than me, I felt like. And uh, and I was like, dude, I'm just a just a guy, a dad that does jujitsu <laughs> and likes talking about it. But I think it's and like when you, you asked me to come on yours, I thought it was super humbling. So it's always nice being a guest on people's podcasts. And I think I'm pretty sure I reached out to you a couple months ago saying we should we should do this, too. And uh, I, I appreciate you, you bringing me on your show. That wasn't what I was. I just wanted to talk to you because. After I started listening to your podcast, uh, there's, there's, so I don't necessarily listen to a lot of like jujitsu podcasts or jujitsu content. And it's not because like I don't want to learn and I don't find value in it. Uh, but there's a lot of just like generic, same old, same podcast yeah. that, that people just rinse and repeat because they hear, you know, a successful podcast doing it. So they're like, oh, so that's what it's got to be like. You know, they ask totally. very mundane questions. They It doesn't feel like they do very much research on the people. And uh, I'm guilty of that sometimes too. Sometimes I don't do a whole lot of research because I kind of want to go into it in a more organic way and just find out who this person is. But some guests I definitely want to do research on. That way I'm not, I feel like I'm not wasting their time because they, right. they but I'm saying all this because when I do listen to someone's podcast, whether it's a jujitsu podcast or something like that, it's because I'm trying to I'm trying to gain something from either how they interview people, how the questions they ask, formatting, whatever it is. I try to like like how can I implement what they're doing because they're doing you know X Y and Z so good into making my podcast better. And with you, it was I felt like you you ask great in depth questions a lot of the times, things that really make people think. I'm like, man. This ape dude, like this guy's got some good questions, man. So I started like Thank listening you. more and more into it. When you when you like come to uh, research a guest or have a guest on your show, how how deep do you go into the weeds of this person? I think it's it's a fine line because when you bring these people on, there, there's so much that you can learn about many of them because most of us have an imprint online. So you can find old interviews, you can find uh, their athletic history, you can go on social and comb through kind of what's their day to day life like, do they, do they have a family? Are they a family person? Are they training frequently? Whatever they do, you can get a pretty good snapshot of it. And if you do too much of that, it's almost as if you have too much information. So I like to get enough of it to get an idea of who they are, and make me curious about different areas of their life but not know so much that I'm predicting what they're going to say. Because like, for example, this is very basic, but if you knew that they won a championship in 2019 and you go, can you tell me about a time that you face adversity in 2019? <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna talk about this thing and you as the conversationalist will already be anticipating what they're going to say because you know it. And by doing that, you're not listening and then you're formulating your next question. So by leaving some of this stuff in the gray, it allows them to steer the conversation a little bit. And I think some of my most favorite conversations or podcasts that I listen to with people are when 
they explore part of who this person is in a way that I didn't expect that they would. So you have on Rampage Jackson, and you think that you're going to listen to someone just talk about punching people in the face and fighting. And then they show you this whole other side of their life or their story that you didn't know. And you're like, wow, how did that happen? Well, it happened because the host gave them the steering wheel for a little bit, and then they went down a different road. And so I think those conversations are always the ones I find most meaningful. And it comes from, I think the the question style is very much from my career as a personal trainer, because when you meet someone for the very first time and you have to take diagnostics on them from uh, their weight, what they eat, their biggest insecurities that they want to overcome things. A lot of time you're learning about them in the first 15 seconds that they don't share with their best friends. So the questions that you ask have to be extremely respectful, but they have to be open-ended. So you can't box someone into an answer. You kind of have to say, tell me more about X. Can you explain how, why, or tell me a time when you X, Y, or Z. And so you really, you give them the opportunity to explore. And so I think a lot of it comes from that is like, you learn as much about this person as you can possibly know before you come and do an assessment on them. But then when they come in, that's when you're going to find out all that exciting stuff, the deep stuff that they keep from everybody else. And those are like the pinnacle parts of who they are that are going to lead to their future success. So that's really where it, where it kind of comes from. Yeah. If I, I listened to a, a, a duo on YouTube called Colin Samir. Uh, I don't love know if them. you, dude, love them. Yeah. I was wearing, during our interview, I was wearing, I bought their Cambo published pressed hat. Yeah. Uh, Cause press I was publish. like, yeah. Published press. Published press. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah, thinking they're, they're, of uh, their, their newsletter. Press for, what's the other one? Think media. Think media. What's yeah, the yeah, press record. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> uh, but so <laughs> I, I listened to them. I love them. And they had Tim Ferriss on their show. And it was by far the, my favorite podcast I've ever listened to, my favorite interview I've ever listened to. And I had never followed Tim Ferriss before until after mm -hmm. this, their interview. So it's really last year I just started listening to Tim Ferriss. And Tim Ferriss had something that, you know, when he talks about his pre-interview or pre-recording of an interview, you know, he does like a setup call with them, get to know them as a person before they even do the actual interview. I don't have time for that. Not only that, but I think it's really weird. I've done it before, and I'm like, eh, this isn't really my thing. It's like a, uh, it's kind of like I. Once again, I feel like sometimes it might, it might you might leave something on the in the green room, right? Like, right. Uh, I think it was uh, Letterman used to say like he wouldn't talk to his guests before they stepped on stage because he didn't want to leave anything in the green room, right? So I feel like that can happen too. Uh, but Tim Ferriss said. When he, before he presses record with the people, the one question he always asks is, and I forgot to ask you, I always ask this question because we were already chit chatting before, but what do you need out of this conversation to make it most worth your time? And I was like, I really love that. I was like, bro, that is phenomenal. Most people are just like, ah, oh, nothing really, you know, but I kind of frame it in a way, especially with the jujitsu community, like what, what do you want to talk about? Is there anything specific you want to talk about to make this worth your value? Are you coming out with the instructional? Are right. you promoting a book? Like what, what do you want to touch on beforehand? That way I know where I can throw it in there, like see if the questions kind of lead to it if I need to need to. And once he said that, I was like, that kind of like changed my whole mindset of how to interview or how to set up an interview because it really it it allows the guest to feel like this isn't for me it's for them i want them to gain the most value of coming on my show you know what i'm saying right. yeah he's a tim is i've I, that that tim's actually the first podcaster i ever listened to years and years and years ago and uh i'd actually I, it all started because i read his book the four-hour work week when i was a freshman in college and it, I, I thought it was fantastic and so I've followed him along, you know, ever since. And he's an extremely meticulous person. Well, well beyond a level that I'll ever aspire to become. <laughs> and I, I mean that in a, a, a complimentary way. Like he, he is extremely meticulous and he goes to such great length. I, I mean, I've read every book he's ever written and hope to one day be able to sit down and have a conversation with him. But I do think a lot about how he prepares for his guests because his like a good actor, he has incredible range in what he can talk about. And I think that that's something that I aspire as a podcaster is to be able to, yes, yeah, stay in, in your niche and build community, because I think that that's a really important part of generating uh, 
meaningful conversations, good listeners, and organic community. But as you grow beyond that, you want to be able to cover a range of different topics. And Tim Ferriss can have on Pavel Tatsulini and talk about kettlebells for two and a half hours. He can have on Hugh Jackman and talk about acting. And then he can have on a Nobel Peace Prize winner and talk about like philanthropy. And he does it all in just a, a spectacular way. And he's very succinct in the way that he speaks to people. He doesn't waste much conversation when he gets in front of his guests. And I really admire that about him because it's it, that question makes so much sense that, that you say that because he really does a good job of highlighting what makes his guests so fantastic instead of uh, filling space about like himself, which is tempting because he's such an interesting guy, you know, <laughs> but it's uh, he's he's an incredible host, man. Yeah. So one thing that I, I did an episode on was how podcasting, when I hit 100 episodes, I was like, how 100 episodes in podcasting has changed my jujitsu journey and how mm -hmm. I view things. What What is the major thing that, if it has, has podcasting of affected your view on something? It's It's made me really aware of how much I want to say. And it's something I'm constantly trying to rope myself back on in conversation with people that I love and care about that are very close to me and in, in private, as well as conversations on the show. And it's, it's hard because I know that it's happening for the right intentions. Like I, I want to keep the conversation exciting, but I have a tendency and I, I open up feedback a lot to listeners. And it's something that I've heard back from people, which I'm very grateful for is that I'll have a tendency to overshare uh, like an idea or a topic that I'm talking about with the guests in an effort to demonstrate intelligence, to be fair, uh, to, to put on an even playing field. And the problem with that is that then the listener doesn't get to hear the guests. And that's what I hope that they're tuning in for in the first place. You know, they're going to hear me every single episode for the <laughs> entire existence of the show. So it's made me try really hard to be a good listener to fight that urge to think about what I want to say next as I'm listening to them and really hear what they're saying. Because a lot of times the most impactful moments of the conversation, the ones that people reach out to after and say, Hey, at, you know, 120, what you guys were talking about that hit home. Those are the ones where I heard what they were saying. And then again, I let the question about what they were saying, steer the conversation further instead of just coming back with, Oh man, I know exactly what you're talking about. That reminds me of a time that I was X, Y, Z and I'll do that and catch myself in the moment and be like, damn it. Um, and that's something I never would have realized. I don't think about myself had I not been face to face with people having conversations, trying to better understand who they are. So that's on, that's on like a daily basis that I think about that now. Has, has anything that you've, any guests that you've talked to change anything about your jujitsu journey? Outside of just uh, active listening and then not trying to overpower guests, because I know that's hard. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> I think uh, speaking. So, so growing up, I was a competitive skier, and I've I have been a staunch hater of steroid users my whole life. Um, when Lance Armstrong tested positive, it like ruined my my world because I looked up to him so much as this athlete that was that was just breaking the mold on what was possible. And in skiing, I was tested by USADA my whole like senior year as a competitor, because if you, if you podium or you get in the top five, they're going to test you anyway, and they can randomly test all the way up to the top 12. And it's serious testing. It's USADA. So like you get in the finish line, you get a chaperone, they follow you until you get to the bathroom in the testing facility. You pee with someone watching you pee. It's very weird to stand in a stall next to someone on their knees watching you pee. <laughs> Uh, so I did that whole thing. And, um, when I got into jujitsu and, and I have been a fan of mixed martial arts since high school, I always really got bummed out when I would see, uh, like a Vitor test po positive or some fighter that I, that I looked up to test positive for doping, like they were cheating and having a conversation with someone like Wagner Rocha, who, who very openly and openly to me admitted uh, testosterone therapy as a 40 something year old man who's still competing in grappling sports. 
it just gave me a different perspective on on like maybe just some of the motivations, right? Like I was always looking at it from one side of the fence and he's like, hey, look, you know, I compete in this rule set that doesn't test on purpose because they want their events to be exciting. I'm in my 40s. I train every single day of the week. It's destroyed my body and I've given myself to this, uh, you know, this career, this journey in jujitsu. And there are guys that do it naturally, which I have the utmost respect for. And there's people that use performance enhancing drugs. His transparency about it just gave me a little bit more like understanding about that side. It didn't make me accept that as something that I would ever want to do, or I would ever want to, to take a chance on. And if I was a competitor, I never would. If it was coming to that, I would step out of the sport. So it didn't change, I, I think, my internal convictions about it. But I finally saw from a different perspective, like, man, some of these guys, they're walking into a cage, someone's trying to kill them. And they're surrounding themselves with, to their efforts, the best people that they know who can care for their strength and conditioning and their nutrition and everything. And they're focused on fighting and developing technique. And somewhere along the lines, someone's like, hey, why don't you just take this? It'll help you. Uh, you know, recover. They go, okay. Or in some cases, maybe they seek it out and that's, you know, shameful in, in my views, but it just, it just showed another side to this whole, uh, sport that was not a way that I had ever looked at it before. And that was through conversation with someone like, with, like Wagner, uh, his honesty about it. I found kind of refreshing and especially in a sport that there's so much, uh, there's just so much drama around that too, but it's a product. I think in jujitsu, I think it's a product of like the rules, right? Some organizations test, some don't. All I would love for is pure transparency by the athletes. Let people know what they're watching. Let people manage their expectations by knowing uh, what people are taking and what they aren't and how close they are on that line. Because there is some crazy lines and supplements of like how close you could be to a, a PED and how close, how far away you could be from a PED. I think for ADCC, they should have the person's name, their affiliation, and then all of the things they inject in their ass. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to like, I've always thought this about sports. So sports that struggle with doping, like cycling, baseball, uh, I'm sure <laughs> wrestling, right? Not, well, uh, performance wrestling, I could care less about. I don't want to go watch some natural athletes jump from the rafters, right? Some 140-pound yeah, guy. <laughs> like, who don't want to see that? <laughs> or jiu-jitsu, like, just be transparent about it. If, if, if every, if, and everyone says this, everyone's doing it. Well, if everyone's doing it, then adjust the rules or be more transparent about what people are taking so that you know as a spectator, yeah, I mean, I, I steroids, go back if, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. Uh, steroids don't, from like a sport strength and conditioning perspective, I think the misconception is they make, they make getting stronger and everything easier. And they don't. What they do is they make your recovery better so that you can put forth a 10 out of 10 effort six days in a row, whereas someone who's natural can put out a 10 out of 10 effort twice every week, right? So if, you can go in and you can train at a 10 out of 10 intensity every time you go in and and recover you're going to be in a much better position than someone else who has to limit that and, and care for their body more so it doesn't make the athlete less mentally durable right like they're no less tough and gritty it's just they're allowing their body to recover at a rate that is unprecedented so you need to decide as an organization like adcc did is that something you care about or not and if everyone in your sport's getting popped for it in IBJJF, maybe you need to either have a sit down with the athletes or you need to re reconsider how you test them and, and what the incentives are that are driving them to choose to dope in a sport where they can make close to no money if they win. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Nick and Rod talks about it, right? And he's like, he's like, look, jujitsu or it, people in jujitsu think that steroids are going to make them better at jujitsu or make their genetics better, right? Like, but if you suck at jujitsu without steroids, it's not like you magically get better at jujitsu because you start taking steroids. Like right. if you're like jujitsu or steroids don't improve your skill and they don't enhance your genetics. If you have, I mean, look at like Craig Jones, if Craig Jones were to get on juice, yeah, he would like bulk up, 
but he's still a tall and lengthy guy. He's not going to turn him into a Gordon Ryan. Gordon Ryan was already always jacked, right? Even when he was like, he's, and he's very clearly taking some. Yeah, you know what I mean. Tedious. Like he's always he's he, he even when before he might have been doing it early on, but Gordon Ryan's physique has always looked the same in the sense of like his definition. Like he's just put more muscle mass yeah, he's on. A, yeah. You know what I mean? So for people to think that, you know, steroids are going to magically is the magic pill for them to compete at a high level uh, is not true. Because like you mentioned in there, like mindset, it takes a lot to compete at a high level. You know what I mean? It takes a lot to go in there and train to be a world champ. And people people are looking for the short road nowadays. And sometimes they'll they'll do it at a young age or they'll get influenced by someone and they're like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to give it a go. My wife is has like a bodybuilding background. And, uh, you know, she would step on stage natural against enhanced bodybuilders. And uh, oh, well, that's part of all sports. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And she would look great up there, but you could always just tell there was a difference. Right. Like yeah. she would never be as lean as them or she would have a harder time putting on as much muscle as them. Uh, she still won pretty much every show she got in. But it was it was, you know, you could tell the difference. Yeah. Do you ever feel like professional sports should have? I know this is a thing. A steroid like, league. <laughs> yeah, steroid league and then a natural league. Um, or do you think it will be infiltrated? The natural league will always be infiltrated. I I, I would love a world where where organizations like USADA are just more effective and the organizations that oversee the implementation of USADA is, uh, you know, is more cohesive with an organization like USADA. I think that specifically in fight sports, but I think you would find this true in other sports, is that at the end of the day, owners of teams and promoters want to make money. So if I own uh, like the Seattle Mariners, right? I want people sitting in the seats every single time that there's a game. And so I want home runs. I want big hits. I want guys running super fast and making diving saves that lights up, you know, the crowd. I want viral content being reshared. I want everything possible to boost ticket sales and fandom for my team. Now, if one of my biggest stars, right, let's see Tatis Jr. is about to join my team, right? And the guy's, he plays for San Diego and he gets popped for steroids. And now my biggest, my biggest draw for seats, hats, merch, everything is gone because of steroids. As a business owner, now I hate USADA. They're <laughs> messing true. up my pocket, right? True. So there needs to be a top-down overhaul on all sports to where the organizations and the promoters find a way. And I have no idea how this works because it's misaligned incentives. Why? How they find a way to cohesively support each other and say either... We stand by USADA and we are going to promote, you know, within USADA, we are going to, we are going to celebrate the clean athlete and we're going to make the clean athlete, the hometown hero. If that becomes the focus and you find a way to market that, which again, I have no idea how you do that <laughs> successfully, that becomes a much stronger opportunity for teams and drug doping organizations to work together to create a cleaner sport and have fans that support the sport. But right now there's butting heads in all different sports because of that money draw. When Vitor Belfort comes into the ring and he looks like he's literally cut from a piece of marble and then he head kicks someone and they <laughs> go to sleep, the building erupts, right? When USADA comes in and says, uh, yeah, but you're fine and you're banned from the sport. Do you think Dana White's gonna be stoked that like his this freaky uh, phenom guy who who just takes people's heads off is now out of the sport? No, he's gonna be pissed. He's gonna hate it. And these are sports, right? right like we're talking about like MLB, NHL, NFL, huge sports, right? Billions of dollars. MMA, really big sport, has grown a ton. Dana White and the UFC have done an incredible job of making this a bigger arena. ADCC fighting for its fucking life, right? To be something bigger. And it, and it is, it's grown a lot over the last, you know, 15 years and it's in a much better position, but they are faced with this problem the most of anyone else, right? So they've decided we're going to distance ourselves from, it. we're not even doing that, right? Come and enjoy the event. It's going to be excellent. These guys are going to grapple. They're going to go really hard. You're going to get your money's worth. IBJJF is trying to have this clean sport vibe 
while every one of their dudes is doping. So back to your question about uh, steroid leagues and stuff, I, I think it would be hilarious if you had a steroid league for the MLB or because you just have a home run you derby, right? Uh, you, I mean, no one would ever play a bigger stadium. Yeah. You would have to, you'd have to push the field out. Exactly. Or like football, right? These guys start throwing the ball 80 yards. Um, so I think it would be funny. I, I don't know if there's longevity in there. And then I think the problem that you mentioned is true that you would have, again, there are malicious persons and malevolent people in different sports who don't care, whose moral compass is totally th thrashed and they'd go, oh shit, well, I can just take steroids and play in the clean league and beat these guys and I'm going to be a star. I don't think that you would, that that would go away by having an alternative where like, Hey, everyone's on steroids over here. <laughs> Come get your face punched in this league. You know? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I don't know that I think cohesion is the best solution and unfortunately the hardest. Yeah. I, I feel like people want to be steroid free, uh, like MMA did because it legitimizes the sport. And I feel like that is something that jiu-jitsu is competitive competitive jiu-jitsu is facing right now is like not being legitimate sport main uh, chael Sutton talked about it there's so many rule sets out there there's so many organizations there's no way to become an actual professional from competing in jiu-jitsu and and you know unless it's adcc where you win i don't know one hundred twenty five thousand dollars or two hundred fifty thousand dollars for first place or something like that but then that's so hard to get there and you know it kind of goes back to like the Olympics too. America just doesn't put a lot of uh, pride in these non, I guess, entertainment sports, I guess you would say. Like our Olympic athletes don't necessarily make an, a living off of being an Olympian and bringing home gold medals against, you know, being the best in the world. As to where like, if you go to Russia, it's like China, they, those kids are from the time they're like eight years old to they're ready for the Olympics. Their, their job is that, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Do you feel like if maybe we put a little bit more pride in these other aspects of sports that we wouldn't be facing this as jujitsu, uh, as a jujitsu community, like the delegitimization of what our, the sport is? Um, I, I don't think so because so I, I used to want to go to the Olympics was like my dream. That was all I, I trained for, thought about, ate, slept and drank like all through until I was a senior in high school. And the, one of the biggest holdups for me was like, you're 100 percent right. I mean, you can name on like one hand the notable people from our lifetime that have made you know a career or became something out of an Olympic recognition like Michael Phelps obviously comes to mind immediately in swimming. Johnny Mosley was my sport, a skier, right? He became a pretty big deal in the United States. You have incredible sprinters and, and recognized athletes, but it's one day every four years and you're four years older the next time that you go, you yeah. know, and if it's not a people tune into the Olympics and then they tune out, they're not going to the events year round. They're not traveling to these unique sports to go watch uh, high jumping or like pole vaulting or sp <laughs> sprinting, right? It's if it's local and, and you know, someone in it, they're probably going to watch. But with those sports, it's, it's hard to make a, a career out of it. And so that trickles all the way down to developmental ages for these sports is like, as a parent, do you want to invest your kid's time and effort into the sport that they're doing beyond the benefits of like learning how to work in a team, developing camaraderie with other people, learning how to share and interact, like all these valuable things that come from sport. But there comes a point in that child's evolution where they have to decide, are they going to fully commit to this thing or not? And with the current state of jujitsu, it's a weird it's an interesting time because there are guys making real money doing this. And I don't think like, I don't think ADCC needs the Olympics to become legitimate for guys to make more money. I think they, they almost have a better opportunity and a lot less bureaucracy, not having to deal with the Olympic committee. If they were to just continue to grow on the track that they are iron out their product, keep uh you know nurturing the development of phenoms at, at younger ages who are being really dynamic in competition i mean you look at like 
their trials turnouts for Southern California were like 10 X what they were before. I mean, ADCC has some steam and I think that they, they could grow the challenge in my eyes. And I, I say this outside of the Olympics. I don't, I don't think that jujitsu needs the Olympics, but there is a, a challenge in wow factor. You can not really understand uh, sprinting, the mechanics of it, the technicality of how to start on a block, inside lane versus outside lane, but you can watch two people race and you understand that one person is going faster than the other. Yeah. You can have no understanding of jujitsu and watch a jujitsu match and you know nothing about what's going on. It makes <laughs> no sense, right? And maybe there's a rule set that uh, promotes it a little better because these guys are standing up and you're like, oh, I, you know, my buddy and I wrestle in the backyard. I kind of get that. Like they're fighting for a position, but no one's getting knocked out. No one's getting knocked down. Rarely are these guys outclassing each other and getting a crazy takedown where they really like slam the dude, especially at the higher levels. So you're left with a sport where you need to understand the technicality of it to truly appreciate what's going on. If you don't know that, uh, it can be explained to you, but then it has to be explained to you by someone who understands it, <laughs> not someone who's brand new. And then the wow factor is is kind of few and far between. So I think ADCC is doing a great job because they're bringing this wow factor by the production of the event. It's incredible. Right? Like you, you watch ADCC 2022. I want to be there. You watch IBJJF The Crown. I'll, I'll like rip a stream, right? It's it's not a wow event. It's not drawing you in and you don't feel like if you're not there, you're missing out on it. Whereas ADCC now kind of makes you feel like if you're not going to ADCC 2024, it's going to hit different on the stream than if you're there in person. So figuring out how to keep wow in the sport, keep those moments like, oh my, like uh, Amy Campo arm dragging her in the last round of the last final and, and that was like crazy right hi some rita arm bar and cyborg in the you know like in the first 90 seconds right those are those are wow moments and you can those are wow moments that transcend experience level you can be a novice or a non-practitioner and be like that was crazy that girl was big and she just fucking brought her <laughs> to the ground Dude, that was nuts yeah. um or you can see gordon choke out galval who looks like he a just like a <laughs> I mean, it looks like a slice looks, of pizza to me. He looks a so walking ridiculous. muscle slice of pizza. Yeah. He looks so ridiculous in that event. So, like you can get that. So when you first started jujitsu, yeah, did the competitive side of jujitsu grab you because of your your background, or did you kind of fall in love with it the more you did it? Uh, I was definitely drawn. So I've always been drawn towards martial arts. Like I've been a fan of the UFC forever, and I would have done martial arts in the town I grew up in, but skiing was. 365 24 7 like where'd again, you grow I did up not uh steamboat springs colorado okay um i did not think about anything else other than that like train all summer ski all winter and that's all i did so martial arts even if they were there i wouldn't have taken the risk of getting injured to not be able to ski so when i got into jujitsu i was i had been done competing like like i really wanted something for a while like 10 years and I got into it knowing that that was part of it. And the, the more that I started to train, I was like, I definitely want to want to give this a shot and compete. Um, my <laughs> So I'll tell you my first introduction into jujitsu, which is hilarious, but it's similar to yours. Uh, I got a group on for $50 unlimited classes at Fabricio Werdum's gym in Venice, California called Werdum Combat. And I was like, that's sick. Cause I used to watch Fabricio in the UFC. This guy's a legend. And it was like two blocks from my house. And at the time I had been professionally a personal trainer for five years, I think. And I was competing in Olympic weightlifting. So I had this competitive thing going on elsewhere and I was training high, like a lot for that, right? Like a uh, five day splits for Olympic lifts, clean and jerk and snatch to go and compete on the platform. So I was strong. I was conditioned. I had plenty of cardio from a lifetime of running and doing run based sports. And I went in there and it, it was cool. Like we did some break falls and, um, some like re guard retention stuff, you know, it was like pretty basic and it was enough for me to be like, 
this is cool. I want to, I want to learn more about this because I saw th those brown belts and black belts where they were doing some really cool stuff and they look like they could whoop my ass. So I was like, this is going to be rad. And as I'm walking out, this guy, Lalo, who's like, it's like five, three brown belt goes, Hey man, you're pretty athletic. Do you want to hang out and spar for a little bit? And I was like, sure. This sounds great. And in my head, I was like, finally, right? <laughs> Finally, I get to spar <laughs> and we, I just had a t-shirt on and, and like gi pants and he's like, we'll just do no gi basically. And he goes, um, I'm going to well, slap hands and you just try to choke me out. Like try to do anything. He's like, anything that you can do, just do that. If you can choke me out, choke me out. If you give me a headlock, uh, arm bar, if you want to do a Kimura, anything you see in the UFC, you just go for it. Just no striking. And I was like, cool. So we slap hands and for basically 15 minutes straight, I just got my ass kicked like <laughs> bad, dude. And I was, again, this guy was like 5'3", maybe 155 pounds. I was 180 pounds competing for Olympic weightlifting. You know, I'm like clean and jerking more than double my body weight. And I just, it like fucking blew me up, dude. I just, I was wrecked. I just couldn't believe that someone that small could destroy me the way that I got destroyed. And I was like, I got to learn more about this. Whatever <laughs> it just happened. I was like, I was walking to my car. I'm like, whatever just happened there, I got to figure more about what that is. Cause like that just, it, uh, it 180 to everything that I knew about toughness, uh, strength, performance, like everything, all the whole, my whole worldview about how being strong and functional could transpire into the world was like jacked up after that. So that was my introduction. It just like hooked me super hard. I, I couldn't wait. I was like, I couldn't wait to go to training every single day. And then I, I jacked my hip up really bad because of, and this is a lesson I learned early on. You can't train for Olympic weightlifting competitions six days a week and train jujitsu four days a week. Yeah, your, no your hip flexors <laughs> will, they will implode. <laughs> and mine did. So I was out for a while. And when I came back, I was like, I'm going to get into this and I'm going to, I'm going to do some competitions and see what that feels like. What was that first competition like? Cause I know from my experience in competitive weightlifting, yeah. it's completely different. Like there was like, I thought, you know, competing in CrossFit, competing in weightlifting, I was like, ah, oh, you know, I got my, it's competition is competition. You know what I mean? And people would always tell me, they're like, oh, competitive jujitsu is you're just doing jujitsu. And I always say it couldn't be further from the fucking truth, bro. It was yeah. a whole different animal stepping on those mats in competitive jujitsu. Um, when you first started, when you, before you stepped on the mats mm -hmm. for the first time for your first competitive jujitsu match, what was going through your mind? So I did that my first one was just an in-house tournament it was it was uh up in la they had one and i was a i was a no stripe white belt um at so this was after that hip injury i, I had left where doom combat and when i trained at this place called Macon carvalho brazilian jiu-jitsu in santa monica and i think i was it was my first month so i was there a month and uh i did this this in-house tournament and it was like i'll compare it to competing in other stuff with skiing, there's so much specific preparation that you do. You always ski the same course. You always work on the same airs that you're doing, like the tricks you do. And then the the environmental factor you deal with is snow conditions. So if it's icy, if it's rainy, if it's snowing, if it's sunny, you know, heat and temperature are going to impact the quality of the snow a lot. So it's going to, that is going to be something you deal with on race day, no matter what. Like when you show up in the start gate, you're going to deal with that, but you can compartmentalize that and go, I'm going to deal with this, but everyone else is dealing with this too. The difference between that and competing in something like jujitsu, and then even more so in something like uh, mixed martial arts, which I've never competed in, uh, there's so many X factors because there's aggression, anxiety, and there's hormonal responses that are happening beyond just nerves when someone else is trying to fight you. And that's like a very evolutionary response to perceived danger. So even though I know that you're wearing a gi and I'm wearing a gi and we're slapping hands, the moment that the, the competition bell rings and now you're actually fighting for something, you have your, you know, your professors there, your teammates, 
you don't want to let your coaches down in skiing, but you're not getting beat up by the hill while you're going down it, right? <laughs> when you're competing in jiu-jitsu, you have like the honor of your school, your professor, all the people that are teaching everything. You're trying to hold that up. There's just so much more mentally that's going on. And as a result, it shows itself physiologically. Your heart rate is way higher. It's much less controllable, at least in the beginning. And then there's this element of tension that you quickly find out was never present in training, especially because you're training with people you know. And even though you guys are going hard, there's a different level of tension and like rigidity to the role when you go against someone you don't know and it's in a competition. So that first one, the first competition was I got tired a lot faster than I thought. <laughs> My arms blew up a lot faster than I thought. And the pace, especially at white belt was like, it was always 10 out of 10 because you only know like a fraction of what you could possibly do. <laughs> so you end up like fighting each other a little bit more, but that changes, you know, the more I competed, uh, it felt less like blacking out in the tournament and more like, I, I guess it's kind of like training, right? Like when you first started as a white belt, like nothing made sense. And now you, ha now you can kind of see things as they're happening a little bit more because you've been training for a while. So the, the last tournament I did in Del Mar was much, I was much more prepared because I, I knew what to do from a strength and conditioning and a preparation standpoint and how to train the intensity in, in the academy. But then the mental preparation was so much better. You know, I just, I got onto the mat knowing what I was getting into and I was mentally sharp and ready for it. So that just changed completely the feeling of being on the mat going against somebody else. You mentioned in there the having the honor of your academy, the honor of your instructor and all that stuff on your shoulders when you're first stepping on the mats. Do you still have that feeling? Because I feel that is a artificial weight that people have that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, like to some people it does, but to me, if you are going on the mats with that, with that in your mind, like, Oh, I can't, I can't disgrace my school. I gotta, I'm a samurai. I gotta fall on the sword. You know what I mean? I feel like that's putting so much unnecessary pressure on most people that listen to this are hobbyists, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to be, most of us aren't going to be a world champ. Most of us don't ever want to be a world champ. We just want to compete to get the experience. And if we put it, all that in our head before we ever step on the mat, I feel like it's going to, it's going to cloud our judgment and it's going to make the whole experience less enjoyable. Do you still feel that way when, when you compete, like you can't, like you're, you're there for your school. Like I can't, I can't disgrace my school. Like they, they're here watching me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel, but I feel that in everything I do. I, I think it's just, it's how I'm wired from competing at a high level at a young age. Like I, I felt, so we're in transition to schools right now and we're training in our professor's garage. So there were eight of us this morning. I felt it this morning training with people that I, I love and care about and I train with all the time. And I, I, th I think you're right. In some cases, that pressure can be negative and it can definitely take away from the enjoyment of competing. But I would argue that on the flip side of that, if you are capable of channeling that, it can bring you to a heightened state of activity and performance that can then bring you all the way to a victory. And then the feeling of a victory is pretty fucking enjoyable. Amen. So <laughs> like maybe it, I think it just comes to it, it. And this is no judgment. It totally depends on the mentality of the person and what they want to get out of it. So if, if you're a hobbyist and you want to compete to get experience and see what it's like, and let's say maybe you haven't competed in stuff before, but you want to know what competition feels like. I think that's awesome. And they should totally do that. I, I think competing is something that everyone should do just just for the realization of how much things change when the stakes are are higher and maybe that's all you walk away with and that's really cool and that's something that uh you know you're able to get from jujitsu that you couldn't have gotten from anything else so i have zero judgment on people that don't adopt that mentality i just personally can't do something kind of and so and if I'm going to compete, I'm going to compete because I want to win and I'm going to train like I want to win. And then the second we touch hands, I'm going to want to win. And that can be a lot to be fair. And 
it's probably why I'm selective about when and where I compete because I know that when I say yes and I click submit, it's an instantaneous switch in how I view my preparation. So I, I'm no longer training just to enjoy jujitsu. And to be fair, it becomes kind of unenjoyable. So <laughs> I'm I'm selective about when and where and what time of year, and I have to you know look at schedule and production and things that are going on to make sure it's something that I can commit myself to for that exact reason. But I think that people can benefit uh, on either side of that coin for different reasons. How old are you? 35. Okay, I just yeah, turned so 35 on January 9th. Dang, happy birthday. I just turned Thank 34 you, in December. So nice. right there with you. Have you noticed any difference in your your body when it comes to competition? You're, I mean, you're very active and you, you do weight lift I, on, on your Instagram story. I feel like every day you're posting like a weight lift in or something like that or something active wise. Have you noticed any not decline, but maybe slowing down now that you're getting a little bit older? So I've the biggest thing I've noticed is my body's in pain all the time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, I was just I was that's joking. my secret. I'm always in pain. <laughs> <laughs> I had uh, yesterday I had Johnny Tama on the podcast which will come out on Tuesday from whatever day this is. And um, we were just talking about that. Like, you know, he's been a black belt and a, a big competitor for a long time. And his body is like jacked up, dude. He's had, you know, back injuries that have laid him out for the season. And I think that the, the what I've found, so being professionally a personal trainer and someone who's done that as a coach for going on a decade now, and then getting into jujitsu much later in my life, and getting into it while competing in Olympic weightlifting, I've realized that there is a very delicate relationship between strength and conditioning and jujitsu for me personally. And this is under the guise of, again, like you said, I'm not trying to be a world champion, right? I'm trying to stay healthy and I'm trying to push the limits of what I'm capable of, get better at an art that I love and be surrounded by like-minded people that are pushing themselves in the same way. So under that umbrella, my number one goal last year was to learn how to take better care of myself from a strength and conditioning standpoint. And what it ended up looking like is reducing my strength and conditioning from three days a week down to two, which I have not done since. I don't think I've ever done that. <laughs> um, now that I think about it. And so this whole year, I, I reduced strength and conditioning down to two days a week. I modified the programming so that it was significantly less intense periodically. So there's moments of intensity, but they're planned. They're much less frequent. So staying very far, far away from PRs, staying very far away from maximal anything. If I'm getting any kind of strength benefit, it's coming in accumulated volume, not max effort. And focusing a little bit more on the conditioning. So keeping up like running, surfing as much as I can, and then being very intentional when I'm training about how I'm training and then how I'm recovering from the training. So if we go in like Wednesday, we get there and our, in this garage, our professor's like, all right, we're doing his <laughs> thick Brazilian accent, right? So I'm <laughs> not going to do it, but he goes, he's like uh, 10, min 10 rounds, three minute rounds, 30 second rest, Bojada, go. And so for basically 30 minutes, we just completely emptied the tank and I'm paying the price tenfold today. I went to training this morning at 6am and I did four rounds and then I, I sat and I was like, you know what? Like my neck feels like it's about to rip in half. I'm going to sit here and just observe visually and see what I can learn from not doing this. That's a decision I never would have made four years ago. I wouldn't have made that a year and a half ago, but that has been the biggest change. And from a composition standpoint, my food and exercise are extremely consistent. So as long as there is output, there doesn't seem to be much change on like, uh, you know, scale weight or I guess aesthetic metrics there. But I think jujitsu is a very powerful, especially in the white belt phase of things, a very powerful output for like composition change because it taps into this thing that's really unique about jujitsu that draws people in that wouldn't otherwise find success pursuing habit change in a more traditional sense. So you'll see guys that they have incredible weight loss journeys, 
but they had failed so many times in like a commercial gym setting or they couldn't figure out how to give up or make the correct food choices and instill these habits within their corporate structure or their work or whatever. But they love jujitsu, so they become really consistent. Then they start eating food because they want to perform at jujitsu better. And then they have high frequency, consistency, and output, and it changes their body. So it's a really powerful tool if you find that frequency. Yeah, one thing that I, to, to back that up, one thing that I, I started a second show called White Belt Wednesday. And one of the things I talk about is how jujitsu holds you accountable. So if you come to class and you're not taking care of yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, then the mat's going to hold you accountable for that. And you're going to have oh, a yeah. harder time training. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it's just a natural progression when you fall in love with jujitsu. Most people do that do not everyone, right? Some people are okay with the life that they live. They just want to show up and be around like-minded people in the community and they're okay with, you know, not performing the best. And there's nothing wrong with that. Your journey is not your journey. Uh, but I do, I do, as someone that used to coach weightlifting or crossfitting, crossfit as well, mm -hmm. uh, the my biggest inspirations weren't the, the big muscular guys that were crushing 500-pound squats and whatnot. It was the the grandma that came in or the mom that came in or the overweight guy that used to be athletic and then you know had an injury and all of a sudden you know small things in life that they took it granted they start right. doing again and they're like i had i had a lady come up to me one time she's like hey travis i just want to let you know i walked up my stairs today and i didn't get out of breath i couldn't tell you the last time that happened and i was yeah. like that is amazing and sometimes it's powerful yeah, and jujitsu does that for people, right? Because they're like you and I, they, they think they're in really good shape or they have this perception of themselves and they step on the mat and they're like, well, that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was different. <laughs> That's that was different. Yeah. And I, I think it's a I think it's a, a great thing for, for people if it's their if it's their motivator, amazing. Keep pushing through it. And if it allows you to tap into something that you've never done before or has been dormant for a long time even better you know if if you start looking at strength conditioning protocols recovery protocols you start looking at nutrition and, and all these things i'm like dude more power to you man let's go just don't beat me you know what i mean yeah. like just let me be let me win still for a little bit <laughs> like, so what it, what does speaking of like your strength conditioning and recovery yeah. what what does that look like for you you do the juggernaut ai also right the chad Wesley smith uh yep. what, so what what does your recovery look like so recovery so yeah i've used chad's um chad's app since i've since i had him on the show and same i th I think it's really good i think it's really good it's like I, i've very used simple other apps before i've written programs for 10 years like i it, it's the plight of the trainer is the joke like uh you know we we write so much programs for our clients but nobody ever wants to program for themselves so the what i like most about his is that it helps me control uh output there's a lot of times where I'm doing a set and I get through and I'm like, I could do that way heavier or more. And I don't because it's the program says not to, and it works. Like, you know, you get stronger over the six to eight week periods that you do it. The volume is managed really well. Chad's obviously a fucking legend uh, at programming at that level. And there's some adjustments I make, you know, if it's equipment based or if there's movements that I, if I'm like, I really just want some dynamic kettlebell work in this six weeks. I'll go in and manually adjust so that I can kind of listen to my body. But the recovery has been recovery has been something that I've hacked aggressively and made a lot of changes to uh, through the process. So my, I said I started this kind of a year ago. So the things that stay, and these are partially backed in science, <laughs> partially backed in I just like them. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, but every day, and I've done this for 375 days now, I wake up and I, the very first thing I do, I get out of bed and I get into my shower and I do a minute cold shower, as cold as it'll go. It's like out of bed into the shower. I started doing that as a kind of a joking challenge with one of my training partners who's in his fifties, uh, who cold plunges every day. And I just, I fell in love with it. Like I, I love the feeling of, I hate doing it. I hate pulling the handle and knowing that I'm going to get hit with that. But I love the feeling of starting my day that way. That has pushed me into this like 
being a little bit more comfortable with cold in general, which in the past I hated. I spent 13 years in the snow. I was like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> Take me to California. So I'll do that. But I also find myself doing three minute cold showers every afternoon now too. Uh -huh. And I'll usually space that if it's strength training, I space it two to three hours after the session so that you still get some of the like hypertrophic benefit of the strength training. You're not shutting that down. If it's on a non-strength training day like jujitsu, I'll do it as soon as I get home. That's been a big one. That's a not backed in science. That's just my protocol. I like the way I feel. It feels awesome. I do feel like generally inflammation in my body is not as intense uh, other than some neck issues. Other uh, recovery is every single night I stretch and I do the same routine. I start standing. I work myself all the way down to the ground and I do this for 10 minutes. I don't do any more than that and I don't do any less than that. I've tried doing more and I become infrequent and I've tried doing less and I feel like I don't get any benefit. So that 10 minute mark for me personally works really well. And then things that I sprinkle on a needs basis are cupping. Um, I don't know if you've had cupping done before, but I bought a cupping set on Amazon. Uh, it, I would not recommend doing that if you're not familiar with it. So <laughs> you go see an acupuncturist or a chiropractor and have them teach you first. I just worked alongside them for so many years, but it's, uh, suction based, uh, like topical massage. So when I get a crick in like my traps or my lats or something like that, I'll just have my fiance put a bunch of them around that area and leave them on for like 20 minutes. That's pretty good relief. And then the other thing that I do is I bought an acupressure mat. This is a, a not backed in science thing that I like to do. <laughs> it's like a, a mat that's full of these little needles and you lay down on it. So when my back gets really tight, what? It's not not like a <laughs> maybe needles is the wrong word there. They're like plastic needles that uh -huh. stick up. I mean, it doesn't look very inviting, I'll tell you that. Yeah. But I lay down on that and I'll lay there for like 10 minutes and it just it helps all the muscles in your back relax. And everything that I do is kind of for my back. It got a total beating through years of skiing. It was just really tough on it. I was in PT as like an 18 year old for my lumbar and she told me I walked like an 80 year old. So <laughs> it's always something that I work against and I'm always trying to find it just ways to loosen it up, ways to keep it loose because I train with a lot of bigger pe like people that are bigger than me as well. And I end up using like spider guard and lasso and stuff like that. So I'm always being driven into like my rhomboids kind of around my shoulders back area in that bent position. So I'm always trying to like, <laughs> I get home and I'm like, D do the other, <laughs> like open up. <laughs> uh, so that, and then uh, massage every once in a while, Epsom salt baths. I did one of those last night. And one of my fucking favorite things that I never had used in the past is a heating pad. When my oh, back's yeah. really bothering me, I just lay on a heating pad for a bit and then do some stretching. So all of this to say, it's all about choosing the right thing to do for the pain you're feeling and doing enough of the recovery to mitigate the pain the best you can, because I want to just be able to train the next day and do something that is like preparing me for the long term. I think that the most valuable lesson I ever got since starting jujitsu was from Steve Cazola, who's one of our black belts, a former Bellator fighter. And I was really like bummed out one day because I was just injured and like I wasn't training the way I wanted to. And he goes, Hey man, rest is a discipline. And I was like, damn, coming from th this, this dude would whoop my ass 10 ways from Sunday in a heartbeat, dude. I would <laughs> be on the pavement before I even open my mouth kind of guy. Right. And to hear him say that, I was like, damn, I, I guess that's kind of true. Like, why, why do I? put so much effort on finding consistency in the output areas and never consistency on the self-care areas. And so that helped me mentally just choose more wisely when to really push it and when not to and who to push it with. So as even though those are not recovery protocols, those two things have probably done more for my recovery than any of the tools that I just talked about, which is intelligently training with your partners because you know the people that you can push it with and you know the people that it's not safe to push it with for you or for them. 
So knowing those different relationships within your academy is so important to everyone staying healthy and then knowing when to shut it down. Like this morning, four rolls in, I wanted to do all of them, of course, but I felt my back being like, dude, you keep doing these. I'm going to snap in the seven, <laughs> like ch 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 pick your poison. So I was like, all right. And, and I'm a grateful for that, right? That is a recovery tool in itself. That choice this morning to reduce the output is helping me recover now so that on Monday I can go back to training. Yeah, I'm going to probably my next episode for my white belt Wednesday is you touched on it in there is like uh, taking breaks in jujitsu. Cause I feel like it's very underrated. I feel like everyone is so worried about consistency in jujitsu. As you mentioned, they want to show up on the mats as much as possible. They want to put in as much mat time as possible that they overlook listening to their body and they overlook yes. taking, taking a week off. Is it going to, is it going to hurt your journey? You know, take a two weeks off. Isn't going to necessarily hurt your journey, right? It depends on your goals and it's much more powerful to be able to listen to your body than, submit someone on the mats. You know what I mean? Right. Because at the end of the day, most of us want to do jujitsu for as long as possible. We want to train for as long as possible. We want to be on the mats for as long as possible. And if you don't ever listen to your body, then you're not going to be there forever. There's, the, and you know? the other part I don't want to be like these Brazilian black belts that are have been training for, you know, 15, 20 years and they have completely replaced discs broken, yeah. you know, destroyed hips, fingers look like, you know, crinkles, you know, it's like, it's like, I don't, that's not me. I don't want that. I want to be, and, and make no mistake about it. Jiu-jitsu is not good for the body. It no, isn't. No. So if anyone listening is under the ruse that this is a, a beneficial yoga like art form that leaves you in better condition than we started, it isn't, it is yeah. extremely tough on the body it's compression of all of your discs it's forced hip flexion against roots i mean the laundry list of why jujitsu is super super bad for longevity is extensive but you can choose to make it your version of intense right so like if your goal is you love this it's important for you it's good for your mental state find a way to train that allows you to keep doing that for the long haul. And there's no shame in that. Maybe it's not competing for that person. Maybe it's not going super hard with the toughest person in the gym. Maybe it is, you know, but like that can be an individual part of that journey is finding out what works best for you that gives you what you want. Because what you don't want on either one of those tracks is that you quit next year because yep. you didn't, you didn't manage your choices well enough. And to the person that's concerned, because I, I think that you hit the nail on the head, there is this like, and, and I struggle with this from time to time. I don't want to miss out on a week, right? I don't want to miss out on that. I can't, I can't take a week off because if I take a week off, then Travis is going to get better. And then the next time we train, Travis is going to whoop my ass. Stupid. If you're at a point where you really need to take a week off, like you can't train, go be around the academy, go watch. Some of my most productive moments in jujitsu have been going when I'm injured and watching my teammates train because you pick up so much. And that might be overkill for someone. Maybe it's like, you know what, I'm not, I don't care that much. So like, I'm not going to go to the academy and drive there, right? On the, on the days in between. Mine just happens to be close and always has. So getting there and watching is a really powerful part for me. And it's one of the moments where like, I feel like a martial artist student the most because I'm there to like watch and learn the art without participating and, and bringing the emotions and everything into it. And you see so much about how you and your teammates train. Like so many times I'll just be watching and be like, man, I do that same thing every single time. <laughs> and that hook is right there. Or yeah. that lapel is right there. Or that underhook is right there. Like whatever it is, you don't see it when you're the person doing the thing. How could you? You don't have a third person perspective on your own training unless you're watching videos diligently, in which case you'll definitely be there on the days that you're hurt. <laughs> uh, but being able to see that is, it's a powerful way to progress your knowledge of jujitsu by visually downloading it instead of just physically downloading it. 
Yeah, and that's where like online courses like Jordan Pressinger's online jiu-jitsu theory course comes into play, BJJ instructionals, YouTube video, like what rewatching some of your own material, like all that comes into play. Like when you take a break from training doesn't mean you have to stop right like entirely. Taking a week off and just focusing on like learning off the mats can be just as powerful as that week of being injured trying to train or well, honestly it's probably more powerful than being on injured on the mats trying to train and not not doing anything because your back hurts or right. you have a broken finger or something like that and taking you know being a dad with three kids working opposite shifts from my wife it's hard to make it to training sometimes and it's something that i've really had to come you know become okay with of not making it to class for a week or a week and a half uh, or even two weeks because you know we only we only have two classes a week that i can make on tuesdays and thursdays and if tuesday morning comes around and my kid's sick or she's teething or there's something going on then i just can't i, I just have to be okay with not going because right. i'm if i'm hard on myself about it then it's just going to make my journey less enjoyable and i'm more likely to stop training you know do you have mean? do you have something in place where let's say it's like a because family can't be undervalued i mean it, it is much more important for you to be there for your family right. than it is for you to be at jujitsu as a hobbyist right so is there anything in place like what's your plan b if your jujitsu plan a falls through i usually work out i just i'll just right. like use it as like a i'll work out in the living room with my kids or yep. i have some kettlebells in the garage or i have a full garage gym but it's been like 25 degrees outside yeah and so my garage is super cold and i don't want to take my toddlers out there and wrap them in blankets with a space heater while i work out so i just i just what are grab you a good dad <laughs> yeah right <laughs> so i just Shame grab my you. kettlebells and i bring them in the house and i'll i'll do some stuff you know some kettlebell work in the house some kettlebell swings some like bulgarian split squats or uh squats or rows upright rows whatever presses with them and i'll just get a, a nice little pump in in the living room while one kid sleeps or you know they get a little bit of screen time and i do it uh or i'll go for a walk or walk on the treadmill i just try to find something if i can't make it to jujitsu i think that's uh, some a big days key are better is, than others the big key is um having a plan b for without becoming a psychopath but having a plan b for everything <laughs> right like that's what keeps people on track and it's what makes people fall off track so you can't get into jujitsu you know that not getting in bums you out what's your plan b oh plan b is work out at home cool i'm doing my home workout today all right and then it, it just it helps you manage those expectations it helps you because look i mean i don't have children we you know we would like to have children in the future or whenever that happens but i don't right now so i Take can't of i it. can't sit here and <laughs> shout down right on someone who's got three kids about consistency because like i don't fucking know what i'm talking about i don't have children so that's another thing that like jujitsu is in the academy you're going to have a mixed bag of where people are coming from right there's always sacrifices that can be made in any situation you just have to make sure that the ones that you're making are right for you and they're right for your family. Absolutely. Hey, Abe, well, we've been going for a little over an hour now. Yeah. This was a phenomenal conversation. I like to end every show with the, the, the same question. If you could give advice to a brand new white belt, what would it be? Hmm. I'm going to think on this for a second. <laughs> do, 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 yeah. do. <laughs> huh. No rush. Oh, I'm not Russian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. It's a good question. It's hard to give. Um, give one, right? To give a single piece of advice. Ah, I would tell them to close their eyes. Why is that? that? Because so much of jujitsu is overwhelming from what you're visually seeing. You see like how big your opponent is, the look on their face. You see the mats, how close you are to someone else. You see all your options, things you could grab, hooks you could get. My Closing my eyes and training, which I do periodically for long periods of time, has changed my proprioception more than anything else, hands down. Much more than weightlifting ever did, much more than 
doing different versions of jujitsu, but closing your eyes and training forces you to start to see with your hands and be spatially aware of what's around you. So if you're inverted and your eyes are open, all you see is that someone's knees in the corner of your eye and you see the floor on your other eye and you're going to smash <laughs> and that's all you focus on. If you're in that position and you close your eyes, you start to feel a little bit of space between your knee and their hip, or you feel a little bit of space between your arm. And so it teaches you about proximity to the, your opponent's body, which is extremely important if you're trying to develop pressure, pressure or pass or prevent passing, right? Staying close to your opponent's really valuable. And then it also teaches you to learn where your opponent's body is and where your options are for hooks, for grips, for attachments without having to see it because so much of jujitsu is unseen. If you're in guard, you can't see your heels hooked together, right? You usually just see your opponent's face. Or if you're on side control bottom, you see the corner of their hand, right? Driving your chin across your bodies to control yourself. But you can't see your feet. You can't see your hips. You can't see whether their belt's loose around their waist. So learning where all those different positions are and rolling with your eyes closed changes your jujitsu like no other thing I've ever done has impacted it that much. That's hands down the piece of advice that I would give to every white belt. And I, someone gave it to me when I was a blue belt. And I wish that they had given that to me when I was a white belt, because I, I would have heeded that advice and followed it and would have had a big impact. And it gets you out of the, especially if you're someone who's coming from like a strength and conditioning background in any capacity, whether you're from CrossFit, bodybuilding, weightlifting, high school sports, your instinct is going to be tenacity, like use what you got, right? What do you got? You got strength and power. So you're going to be powerful and strong. Closing your eyes undoes that because uh, it teaches you, you don't trust being powerful if you can't see where your power is going. So you'll stifle it a little bit automatically and it'll teach you more about where you are in, in space than anything else. Heck yeah, man. That's a great piece of advice. No one's ever said that. So that's the first time someone said that on this show. It <laughs> there we go. <laughs> if you guys are, aren't watching, he just dabbed. <laughs> yeah, I did. I only do that every once in a while. And I do it to roast myself. I want to be very clear. I don't do it to be serious. I do it to make fun of myself. That's funny. Which is well, important. Hey, if you can't roast yourself, you have no business roasting anybody else. That's fast. Amen, brother. Amen. Got to make. Got to be able to take it if you want to dish it. Hey, Indeed. if people want to find you... Uh, where, where can they find you at you and your fantastic podcast? Thank you. Yeah. Um, main idea podcast.com. It's spelt unfortunately different than how you think it is. So it's M a Y like yellow N like Nancy main idea podcast.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Abe Maynard and you can, if you're into skiing and strength and conditioning, you can go <laughs> check out my ski website. Uh, there's strength and conditioning programs on there for snow athletes. So it's get ski system.com. Or if you want to train, Carlsbad, California. There you go. All right, guys. Hey, well, go check out Abe. Everything's going to be down in the links down below. Make sure you guys go give him a follow. Check out his podcast. Give him a five-star review. Uh, if you're listening and you haven't given me one, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, come on. Cool. Do it, guys. Give Travis a five-star <laughs> review. I, I say this on my show, and I, I don't think I can ever say enough. The value of a review is so huge because yeah. it positions our shows in front of other people that listen to similar stuff. So give Travis five star review. It'll put his show near other jujitsu shows, strength and conditioning shows, white belt shows. Uh, and it helps us both so much with organic growth. And that's what we care about. Heck yeah. So, so all right guys, well, thank you so much for listening and watching at home. Uh, and remember no oil checks here. Peace.